And with that, over to Liz. Hello. Um, I worked out that it is 30 years ago since I was sitting my A levels, just uh, probably just about finished. Actually, I'm in weather a bit like this because I remember the last part of revising the physics A level sitting on the bench in weather like this. And, and then I went to university so I could change the world by studying soil and land resource sciences. And it was one of the last cohorts that probably was able, as an undergraduate, to study something called soil and land resource sciences. And I got obsessed pretty quickly. It was a, it was a strange route. I did science A levels. I wanted to do something that made a difference. I didn't just want to do chemistry or physics or biology. I wanted to do something that made a difference. So I went to agriculture. I wasn't from an agriculture family. So then it's more complicated to study agriculture because you need to have a background in practice. So agricultural science seemed okay. I wanted to do animals because, hey, if I wanted to do animals, I would be a vet. And if I didn't really want to do plants because biology at school had been very, very boring and I was sick of the Krebs cycle. So actually the only thing left for me was soil science. And actually the in straight, almost straight away, almost the first reading I was given to understand what it was I might be going to study, talked to me about those interacting worlds below our feet that we weren't seeing, but with the above ground, with climate, with roots, with biology. And it was a new naturalist series book, E. John Russell's book, The World of the Soil, that I was given to read and actually kind of enchanted me and that, that <coughs> way and caught my attention. And you will hear, if you hear me here or in any soil pit talking to any farmers, I haven't lost that obsession and enchantment and delight in exploring what soils can tell us. So my question though is actually, should we measure soil health better? And if we do measure soil health better, will it actually help us to get better, healthier soils on UK farms? And I want to tell you a little bit of that story that's based a little bit on my science and where research might take us in that context, but also some projects that we've done, a whole set of we in this context, with farmers over the last few years. And the, the document that most of you won't have read because it's far too big, that I supplied as a, a feeder document for the workshop is actually the output report of one of those projects that Christine Watson and I did together, bringing together science and farm practice. So what we found in that piece of work that you have the big report for if you want to find out more is that farmers were already doing really innovative things with soil biology. So science knew some things, but farmers were doing already incredibly innovative things. They were actually pushing the boundaries, they were taking very site-specific, locally adapted approaches, they were taking local materials, they were aware of their own limitations, the opportunities, and trying out some things that we might all think of as very wild and wacky. And I guess we saw some of the emerging similarities with, with work, though not so extreme, in India yesterday, that, that farmers are already pushing the boundaries and saying, that science, well, it doesn't tell us the answers we need. But what that gives us is a whole set of changes that are happening simultaneously with one another. So farmers don't say, let me change my tillage practice, I'll leave everything else exactly the same, the drilling date will be the same, the variety I grow will be the same. They change many things simultaneously. And so what we've got a whole range of multifactorial changes that give us a whole range of innovative systems containing a whole plethora of practices which are combined in different ways and of course in different seasons on different soil types. And that's great and challenging and fantastic and also, well, for research, a little bit problematic. So the systems, if I was off to show farmers good practice for soil management that I would take them to see, would almost certainly be systems such as organic farming systems, but not every organic farming system. Conservation tillage systems, that's that fully integrated FAO definition. Not just zero tillage, but the integration of cover crops um, and, a, and an attention to the integrated farm management and permaculture systems. And in the UK, we have all of those. Um, and what was interesting in the workshops that we held were the conversations that farmers from those very different systems who thought they had very little in common actually found they did have in common when they too began to talk about what we call my soil story, their stories of how they were working with and using the soil. And the kind of practices that they were putting together, sometimes that worked together, sometimes that didn't, 
were that list there that you've undoubtedly read while well, I've been wondering on and I don't need to read out. I guess the most important thing to say about those practices, though, is that the top ones with the bullet points are what we might call, and we developed some, there is some jargon around this, system orientated practices. So these are things that don't just change one thing, but change a number of things. They're implemented on a rotational basis over a long term. They're part of an integration into the whole way of working of the farm. They're not the same as an individual practice I might put in place on a crop basis, which are those ones at the bottom. So as an adjunct, perhaps farmers might, after they've done some of those system orientated things, say, now how can I use compost tea? I've heard compost tea is a really good thing. But they usually weren't doing that as a replacement immediately for a pest treatment, for a pesticide, for example, they were doing it as part of or as an adjunct to a whole set of other reorientations. And we are seeing increasingly in the farm community all sorts of good things happening, including farmer observation of what's happening in their soils, including biological based <coughs> measures. And if you haven't caught up with the uh, Soiling My Pants initiative, it's a marvellous piece of communication and investigation opportunity, of course based on some really quite rigorous scientific methodology about cotton strip assays. Uh, that have been used to understand rates of decomposition for a long time. And at many farmer meetings, particularly this summer, you will see washing lines of soiled pants <laughs> up there with farmers discussing how these pants are working in their farming systems. And it's, it's a matter of pride about how fast my pants are decomposing. <laughs> and here, just a couple of examples, and they're probably not unsurprising, the plot, these are, these are farm-scale trial plots from NIAB, without compost and with compost, but otherwise, not exactly, but pretty much treated the same, that we have more biological activity in the, the plots that are receiving compost, but nonetheless nice to see. And <coughs> there are some surprising data too coming out of here, some faster rates of decomposition, for example, associated with plowed, some plowed, quite intensively plowed systems, than with some conservation tillage systems. And probably not a surprise, because of all the controlling factors, but gives you a point to talk to farmers. What's research up to in the same period? So this is work that I did probably five years ago, looking at the way in which nutrients move through the nanometer scale interactions between roots and soils, how those plant roots and microbes might fight for nutrients below ground. And so we just were using um, mass spectroscopy, side impact mass spectroscopy, mapping different elements, which means we can find sand grains, which is a silica, with not much of that mineral material in, inside the plant at the root center. Carbon and nitrogen, obviously, we start to see the cells and the steel here of the main plant uh, water conducting system of the designer in the middle of the plant there as we move through. These don't, aren't directly adjacent fields, but they give us that scheme moving from the middle. And we see the clusters of microorganisms, the very bright concatenations of CNN here in this soil matrix. And the story for farmers is always that it's a bit like, if you look at the soil like this, it's like flying over a, a, a landscape at night. There are dark places where nobody lives and then places where lots of people live. And we see the same thing. And we put into this matrix some labelled ammonium and we were looking at the competition between the plant root and the microorganisms, who wins for ammonium is the question. We use amino acids as well. It's quite a complicated set of entertaining questions. But I think we were very surprised actually at how the silica appears to just light up after five minutes. It shouldn't, it's got very few exchange sites. There's something very immediately physical about that association. But the, the relationship here with those, those microbes, can you see that cluster of microbes there? Some of them are also responding very quickly to that ammonium and some not. And in the plant cells, it's the apoplasm, the gaps between the cells that are holding and absorbing the ammonium quickly, which is not a surprise. And then it's metabolized through the uptake inside the cell walls much more slowly, so that the apoplasm acting as a reservoir for that ammonium. Complicated, crazy, world beneath our feet, something as simple as a little bit of fertilizer reacting within five minutes into all these processes. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, 
<laughs> if we want to try and put that into something that makes sense for farmers, we start to have to make diagrams that look a bit like this. Here's a nice, simple <laughs> understanding of how soil fertility, just one function, and here sort of de type defined as nutrient supply, might be driven by a range of biological, physical, chemical factors in the soil, and of course those plant factors. So soil scientists are awake now to the fact that we need to take plants and plant roots into account in our study of the soil. They're not separate, but an intimate part of that world below ground. And so some of those things that are in the pictures I've just shown you from our very detailed work are in here. They, they become important. How many roots there are, where they are, how many microbes they are, where they are. But then there's a whole range of driving factors from the environment, which farmers have no control over, together with a set of management factors and just the nutrient inputs ones here, show that, that farmers do have control over. And at the end of the day, this soil function is a result of the interacting processes and between factors in different times and at different scales that give us that integrated outcome. And if I study it at nanometer scales, I might get one answer, but of course a plant integrates over thousands of nanometers to obtain its results across its whole room level. So when I take my knowledge into a field, <laughs> when I try to take the practice that I've developed into the field, I take it to the farmer who stands there and says to me, well, tell me what it is I should be doing. Actually, I find that that's a challenging set of conversations. The research is not invalid in its context, but it doesn't always help me answer my farmers' questions. We have tried in research, and this is very old research, this is 1960s data, to create an underpinning framework for the understanding of data such as the amount of phosphorus that can be extracted from soil and whether it's plant available or not. And so we get a classic here, <coughs> response curve so that the crop is more likely to respond to fresh additions of fertilizer at low levels of ex extractable phosphorus from the soil and less likely to respond as the phosphorus level, the base phosphorus level in the soil increases. And it's data like this from long-term experiments, data from Rothamsted, that give us the classic, and they are very classic and now rolled out largely around the world, index data. I have phosphorus status, index two, this means I'm here about in the response curve around 25 to 35. I'm unlikely to get much response to additional phosphorus, but I need to keep on topping up that phosphorus in the soil, which is great. Here's an average result from a lot of data <coughs> that I need to take and talk to a non-average farmer with a non-average site. And actually, we already knew that was from the same experiment at the same time. The only change, the organic matter level in this plot, a huge difference in the response curve. Yeah, so we've got a, a shift leftwards. So now, actually, if I have 25 to 30, I really probably shouldn't be putting on any phosphorus. But what's this to do with? And, and there's a lot of work that underpins this that show it was the physical properties that were changed in the soil and the ability of the plant roots to use the phosphorus in the soil rather than a phosphorus supply mechanism. Talk about it for hours. <laughs> but research has therefore worked hard to try and draw out rules of thumb, averages, ways of talking that give general rules to farmers. And this is probably as good as we get. And I was pleased they nearly matched some of Kate's in terms of the biological ones that she was talking about yesterday. It's probably not a surprise, Kate, because you and I have probably reviewed some of the same, much of the same literature to put them together. So it means that when someone like Tom goes into a field and says, farmers, what you need to do is put on more organic materials and you'll get more earthworms. Farmers go, yes, people have been telling me that for years. I know those general principles, but can you tell me specifically what, how, which organic material and how much and what way should I put it on and how should I use it? So although science is very good at developing, has the techniques to develop these general principles for general states, for that are useful if we don't give the farmer the real detail that they need in their specific location, in their specific site, they need to be able to take the information and apply it and use it. And that work with those farmers across the UK, the innovative farmers working on soil health, 
gave us these statements. These are the exact formal words telling us what they wanted from the kind of advice that we were then going to go away and be developed. Just go to that Certainly what they don't want, and no farmer who's ever stopped me in a soil pit has ever said, give me some general principles to work with. <laughs> so research has tended over the past the years I've been working in this area to find really important, big, global themes and challenges. And then do some really detailed stuff that has some tenuous connection. We're very good at making it in our grant proposals. You know, this piece of work we're going to do at root soil interactions is actually going to inform food security decisions of smallholder farmers in Africa. <laughs> and luckily, the research funders usually believe us. And actually, there is some connection. That is to say, there is. Well, research is very good at studying the impacts of management practices. This practice has made these changes happen, but perhaps less good at saying, how can we design better management? Very good, and its statistical framework has constrained it to some extent in this way, at saying let's study particular impacts of particular practices, usually single or perhaps double factorials. We can manage that many, otherwise the plot numbers get a bit big and it all gets a bit crazy, and the sampling costs look very unrealistic on the grant proposal. We assess, though, a range of outcomes. We do look at a range of things, but not always the things perhaps the users are interested in. And I think that perhaps the control that we, we natural scientists want is a constraint to realism. That we try and control the world so much that the world we study, me growing my wheat to do that labelling experiment in little pipette tubes so that it didn't get constrained or covered in quite clean sand. So there were lots of things we were leaving out of the process. We have a whole range that we've talked about in this context of definition and scaling issues. Is what we study at one scale really happening at another? How do we make those things work? And anyway, what is this soil health and, and what do we mean by it? And the complexity of the systems that we study gives us a great opportunity, but also can act as a real barrier. At the same time, there's an awful lot of stuff happening on farm where farmers know they're messing their soil up. There's no question about that. Stand in a hole with a farmer, he will absolutely say it's not like it was when my grandfather did it. There's no, there's no question that farmers don't recognise the harm in the UK they've been doing to soils, that they actually already recognise the kinds of things that might work better. They've heard the message about wanting more organic matter in the soil and so on. But their options are very constrained by things that maybe research doesn't look at very well. And their response is to do a lot of things by trial and error and not just one at a time. And those drivers are things like we control as much as they are about soil management and they, they interact. And their questions to us are, so does any of this actually make any difference? Tell us how to, to do it better. So the kinds of things they're asking us for, when you have a thing, are tools to help them. So does measurement help? Well, the, inter the Innovation for Ag survey, not a representative survey of farmers, but it's not bad because it, it picked up farmers not who were interested in soils, like the ones I talked about, the ones who were coming to agricultural society meetings. So they're engaged farmers who are interested in talking to other farmers, but <coughs> not particularly necessarily engaged in soil. 166 of them did surveys and all that background data that you can see tells me that that's not a bad picture of farmers, certainly in England. Yeah, the sort of balance of arable and livestock and mixed farmers and farm sizes is about right. And actually, perhaps we should be excited because 90%, 97% of them are doing some sort of analysis. Who's doing the sampling? Actually, I think we were quite surprised that it's quite often the farmer doing the sampling. Why are they doing it? Well, they're mostly doing it to inform their crop nutrition decisions. How to use perhaps and then think about the number of mixed farmers, how to use their manures most effectively. Some things about tillage, and some interesting stuff here about what they're measuring. Yeah, there's a, there's a much bigger list, that's a, a, a deliberate hit, where the chemistry dominates, 
the PHP Pay MG is the standard soil analysis in the UK. If I send off for an agricultural soil analysis, MG is a bit of an option, so about 20 fewer farmers said they actually asked for the magnesium analysis. But, and I think a relatively small number still doing those add on things like organic matter, which is actually very easy to add on about five pounds extra a sample. But that's probably because we're not giving them the tools to interpret what those numbers mean. Tom will be pleased. It wasn't a deliberate plot, it isn't a group of farmers he was particularly engaged with, but 30 of that set were already measuring and doing things with earthworms, despite the fact that's only a developing area. And a very small number are trying to do other microbial things too. And perhaps most exciting for me is the number who are also doing soil structure as well as chemistry, probably not at the same time on the same samples, which is the thing that interests me about bringing those data sets together. But if I want to develop best practices for soil and crop management, does measuring stuff help? I don't know that it does. Because you know what? I can probably guess what the best practices might be without needing to measure if they've got any impact or not. You know what? Cleaning organic matter is a good thing. Whether or not I can measure a change in the organic matter in the soil, whether or not I can do it in 10 years or 20 years or however. Actually, farmers shouldn't wait to do their organic matter management to improve their organic matter management until we can measure it better. And for my final point, I just want to do a bit of my own semantics. My best story with farmers in the field at the moment is to say, you've come to ask me about soil management. I don't want to talk to you about management because if you go home and try and manage your wife or husband, it won't work. It really won't work, I promise you. And you all know that. You all are laughing, so you all know that too. We used to use a word in English, and I don't know if we did in other languages, that wasn't soil management, but was soil husbandry. We talked about crop husbandry, we talked about soil husbandry. And there's something very different about husbandry than there is about management. It's about that attentiveness and attention to detail. Yeah, there's the care ethic in it, but other things too, the relationship word, the, the, the dynamics of that relationship, that constant change. There's a lot in, in English, and I don't know if it works in any other language, the husbandry word. We don't know where it went. It disappeared from the language of soil science at some point, and Stephen might be able to tell me, <laughs> in the time that I was studying soil science. Certainly textbooks when I was studying soil science had the word in, by now they haven't. I actually think what we need are better tools, some of them will be measurements, and some of them won't be, to support the best soil and crop husbandry, not management. you're more likely to be a person who's doing things on the farm rather than passively receiving. Yes, the survey is fertilizing practice. Yes. And that's, I think that's possible. Yeah, the reason, the reason for that one is because they were asking a lot more questions about how you choose your, um, how you choose your labs and which methods you use on the, the, the IFA, the, sorry, the survey purpose is telling you people doing testing. Yeah. It doesn't tell me how they're using it online. <laughs> Thank you for this very inspiring presentation. Um, when you say that um, soil health measurements is not um, necessary you know, for farmers, do you put into question the legitimacy of uh, the agronomics for science research indirectly? Because, you know, agronomists, they get money for, to produce research around this. So it's, I think, and I'm questioning myself as well, what does I have money to develop a soil health tool? <coughs> I just think we need to, I think, it, there's a whole set of conversations I've had over this couple of days that are 
things around. It's really good to spend a bit of time talking about, for example, the definition of what soil is or what soil quality is or what soil health is. But if that becomes the only point to the conversation, it becomes pointless. Yeah? It is quite good to spend a bit of time thinking about how we might measure soil health, but if we become so obsessed whether we should measure organic matter by loss of ignition or dew mass, or whether the loss of walking black is a critical <laughs> thing to the, to the soil science community, and maybe a bit of what you're talking about. Yeah, and actually, soil scientists can spend hours talking about these things. It doesn't really matter, because all of those give a reasonable approximation to have a conversation with farmers about. So we can get distracted. Tools are useful, but we need to think about them as tools, not as ends in themselves. And it's that means and ends, I think, that's important. And I, I am working with farmers to, to look at how to use measurements. But when I say measurements, I include things like in-field observation, qualitative scores of soil structure, as well as accredited laboratory analysis, and putting all of those kinds of information together to give you a good picture. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about your, um, your survey and the, the, the types of uh, measurement that these farms are doing at Bertel. So is it all very formal in terms of when they're measuring earthworms? Are they digging a, a pit of a certain size and counting, or are they just looking for moles or casts or, or more informal things? So I was, I was wondering if that, those measurements are uh, say scientific, or are, are they are they also included within that sort of more informal kind of So the, the survey wouldn't tell me the answer. Yeah. Is the simple answer to your question. Okay. Yeah. So the question says, uh, have you taken and undertaken any biological measurements? And you just do a yes or no. And if you say yes, you tell me which ones you did. And it just says earthworms and you tick the box or not. The fact that actually over the last five years we have done some work with farmers to train and identify earthworms using open procedures largely means that some of them will be doing it at least approximately right. And anyway, I think Tom, I think, would say it's better to have a go and you're not doing it at all. So, I've done this with a lot of farmers and try so it takes about 20 minutes to do it and I've never got to the end. Because they just fire questions, they get distracted, it's all like school children are off here doing something else and then you're like, you're like no, we're trying to do this procedure. <laughs> Should we finish it now and we won't bother at the moment? So uh, I, I very much doubt that anyone's doing it in a really rigorous context of but, no, but, but knowing that's important because actually the kinds of observations that farmers do about reference are there few, many, or lots, and what that means yeah. is probably enough to give them an indicator of if we think it's a good indicator of on what over numbers are doing and having an understanding of how maybe they change through their cropping systems or between their potato fields, there won't be any, and their um, uh, lay fields. And so it's as a conversation tool, but scientists get a bit obsessed with what are they doing properly. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to Oh, yeah.